Anterior abdominal wall, the attachments of the muscles of anterolateral abdominal wall are given in this chapter. The formation and contents of rectus sheath are mentioned. The inguinal canal has been described in detail as its relations are of importance in the reduction slash repair of the inguinal hernia. The heading anterior abdominal wall usually includes both the front as well as the side walls of the abdomen and needs to be called anterolateral abdominal wall. Surface Landmarks Before taking up the description of the abdominal wall proper it is desirable to draw attention to some surface landmarks that can be identified in the region 1 in the anterior median plane, the abdominal wall extends from the xiphoid process which lies at the level of the ninth thoracic vertebra to the pubic symphysis, which lies at the level of the coccyx. Posteriorly and laterally, the vertical extent of the abdominal wall is much less, as it is replaced by the thoracic cage, above and behind, and by the gluteal region, on the posterior aspect of the lower part. The superolateral margins of the anterior abdominal wall are formed by the right and left costal margins. Each margin is formed by the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th costal cartilages. The costal margin reaches its lowest level in the midaxillary line. Here the margin is formed by the 10th costal cartilage the transverse plane passing through the lowest part of the costal margin is called the subcostal place. It passes through the third lumbar vertebra. To the infrasternal or subcostal angle is formed between the right and left costal margins. The xiphoid process lies in a depression at the apex of the infrasternal angle at the level of the 9th thoracic vertebra. 3. The iliac crest forms the lower limit of the abdominal wall at the side. The highest point of the iliac crest lies at the level of the fourth lumbar vertebra slightly below the normal level of the umbilicus. For the anterior superior iliac spine lies at the level of the sacral promontory. 5. The tubercle of the iliac crest is situated on the outer lip of iliac crest about 5 cm behind the anterior superior iliac spine. The intertubercular plane passes through the tubercles. It passes through the fifth lumbar vertebra. 6. The inguinal ligament extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. It is convex downwards. It is placed at the junction of the anterior abdominal wall with the front of the thigh. 7. The spermatic cord is a soft rounded cord present in the male. It can be felt through the skin as it passes downwards near the medial end of the inguinal ligament to enter the scrotum. It can be picked up between the finger and the thumb. When palpated in this way a firm cord-like structure can be felt within the posterior part or the spermatic cord. This is the ductus deferens. 8. The anterior abdominal wall is divided into right and left halves by a vertical groove. It marks the position of the underlying linea alba, Latin white line. 9. A little below the middle of the median furrow there is an irregular depressed or elevated area called the umbilicus Latin navel. It lies at the level of the junction between 3rd and 4th lumbar vertebrae. 10. A few centimeters lateral to the median furrow, the abdominal wall shows a curved vertical groove. Its upper end reaches the costal margin at the tip of the 9th costal cartilage. Inferiorly it reaches the pubic tubercle. This line is called the linen semilunaris. It corresponds to the lateral margin of a muscle called the rectus abdominis. 11. The transpyloric plane is an imaginary transverse plane often referred to in anatomical descriptions. Anteriorly, it passes through the tips of the ninth costal cartilages, and posteriorly, through the lower part of the body of the first lumbar vertebra. This plane lies midway between the suprasternal notch and the pubic symphysis. It is roughly a hand's breadth below the xiphysternal joint. It passes through pylorus of stomach, hyla of the kidneys, fundus of gallbladder neck of pancreas, origin of coeliac axis and superior mesenteric arteries. 12. The angle between the last rib and outer border of erector spiny is known as renal angle. It overlies the lower part of kidney. 
the twelfth rib may only be just palpable lateral to erector spiny or may extend for some distance beyond it. Thirteen posterior superior iliac spine lies about four centimeters lateral to the median plane. Fourteen three transverse furrows may be seen crossing the upper part of rectus abdominis, corresponding to the tendinous intersections of the muscle. One usually lies opposite the umbilicus, the other opposite free end of xiphoid process, and the third midway between the two. Dissection Give an incision from xiphoid process till the umbilicus. Make a small circular incision around the umbilicus and extend it till the pubic symphysis. Carry the incision laterally from the umbilicus till the lateral abdominal wall on both sides. Give curved incisions 3 cm below from anterior superior iliac spine to pubic symphysis on either side. Finally give a oblique incision from the xiphoid process along the costal margin till the lateral abdominal wall on either side. Carefully reflect the skin in four flaps leaving both the layers of superficial fascia on the anterior abdominal wall. Make a transverse incision through the entire thickness of the superficial fascia from the anterior superior iliac spine to the median plane. Raise the lower margin of the cut fascia and identify its fatty and membranous layers. Note that the fatty layer is continuous with the fascia of adjoining parts of the body. The membranous layer of anterior abdominal wall is continuous with the similar fascia, colles fascia, of the perineum. Note its attachment to pubic arch and posterior margin of perineal membrane, inferior fascia of urogenital diaphragm, locate the superficial inguinal ring immediately superolateral to the pubic tubercle. Note the anterior cutaneous branch of the iliohypogastric nerve piercing the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle a short distance superior to the ring. The spermatic cord slash round ligament of uterus along with ilioinguinal nerve leave the abdomen through the superficial inguinal ring. Identify the external spermatic fascia attaching the spermatic cord to the margins of the ring. Divide the superficial fascia vertically in the median plane and in the line of the posterior axillary fold as far as the iliac crest. Reflect the fascia by blunt dissection from these two cuts and find the anterior and lateral cutaneous branches of the lower intercostal nerves along with respective blood vessels coming out from the anterior and lateral regions of the abdominal wall. The skin the skin of the anterior abdominal wall is capable of undergoing enormous stretching as is seen in pregnancy, with accumulation of fat, called obesity or a fluid called ossitis, and with growth of large intra-abdominal tumors. Stretching may result in the formation of whitish streaks in the skin of the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall, these are known as lineae albicantes. The umbilicus. Definition. The umbilicus is the normal scar in the anterior abdominal wall formed by the remnants of the root of the umbilical cord. The position of the umbilicus is variable. In healthy adults it lies in the anterior median line, at the level of the disc between the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae. It is lower in infants and in persons with a pendulous abdomen. Apart from its embryological importance there are several facts of interest about the umbilicus. There are, anatomical importance. 1. With reference to the lymphatic and venous drainage, the level of the umbilicus is a watershed. Lymph and venous blood flow upwards above the plane of the umbilicus, and downwards below this plane. These do not normally cross umbilical plane. 2. The skin around the umbilicus is supplied by segment T10 of the spinal cord. 3. The umbilicus is one of the important sites at which tributaries of the portal vein anastomose with systemic veins, Portosystemic anastomosis. In portal hypertension, these anastomoses open up to form dilated veins radiating from the umbilicus called the caput medusae. However, the blood flow in the dilated veins is normal, and does not break the barrier of the watershed line. Direction of blood flow in superior vena cable obstruction, and in inferior vena cable obstruction shown in. Embryological importance. One umbilicus is the meeting point of the four, two lateral, head, and tail, folds of embryonic plate. Two this is also the meeting point of three systems, namely the digestive, vitellointestinal duct, the excretory, uricus, and vascular, umbilical vessels. Black small square remnants of the vitellointestinal duct may form a tumor at the umbilicus, raspberry red tumor, or cherry red tumor. 
persistence of a patent vitellointestinal duct results in a fecal fistula at the umbilicus. Black small square persistence of proximal part of vitellointestinal duct is Meckel's diverticulum. Black small square persistence of middle part of vitellointestinal duct is enterocele. Black small square persistence of the uricus may form a urinary fistula opening at the umbilicus. Black small square umbilical vessels at birth can be identified at the umbilicus. These are two tortuous umbilical arteries and a single umbilical vein. For some clinical conditions, these vessels need to be catheterized. Black small square umbilical hernia is seen if any weakness is present at the umbilicus. Superficial fascia One below the level of the umbilicus, the superficial fascia of the anterior abdominal wall is divided into a superficial fatty layer fascia of camper, and a deep membranous layer fascia of scarpa. The various contents of the superficial fascia run between these two layers. The facial layer is continuous with the superficial fascia of the adjoining part of the body. In the penis, it is devoid of fat, and in the scrotum it is replaced by the dorto's muscular. The membranous layer is continuous below with a similar membranous layer of superficial fascia of the perineum known as Collet's fascia. The attachments of scarpus fascia of the abdomen and of Collet's fascia of the perineum are such that they prevent the passage of extravasated urine due to rupture of urethra backwards into the ischiorectal fossa and downwards into the thigh. The line of attachment passes over the following. A Holden's line, it begins little lateral to pubic tubercle and extends laterally. B pubic tubercle, see body of the pubis and the deep fascia on the adductor longus and the gracilis near their origin, D margins of pubic arch and the posterior border of the perineal membrane. E above the umbilicus the membranous layer merges with the fatty layer. In the median plane, the membranous layer is thickened to form fundiform ligament of the penis or clitoris. 3 The fascia contains, A an extremely variable quantity of fat, which tends to accumulate in the lower part of the abdomen after puberty. B. Cutaneous nerves and cutonous vessels. Superficial lymphatics. Membranous layer of superficial fascia of abdomen is continuous with the superficial perineal pouch via scrotum and penis. At times the urethra may rupture and urine extravasates into this space. Cutaneous nerves. The skin of the anterior abdominal wall is supplied by the lower six thoracic nerves, lower five intercostal and subcostal, and by the first lumbar nerve in the following manner. The anterior cutaneous nerves, seven in number, are derived from the lower five intercostal nerves, the subcostal nerve and the iliohippogastric nerve, L1. T7 T12 nerves enter the abdominal wall from the intercostal spaces. They pass between internal oblique and transversus muscle, pierce the posterior lamina of internal oblique aponeurosis to enter rectus sheath. Within the sheath, they pass behind rectus abdominis, then pierce the rectus muscles and the anterior wall of the rectus sheath close to the median plane, divide into medial and lateral branches and supply the skin of the front of the abdomen. They are arranged in serial order, T7 near the xiphoid process, T10 at the level of umbilicus, the iliohippogastric nerve 2.5 cm above the superficial inguinal ring, and others at proportionate distances between them. Subcostal nerve supplies pyramid alice while iliohippogastric and ilioinguinal do not enter rectus sheath. Iliohippogastric becomes cutaneous 2.5 cm above the superficial inguinal ring. The terminal part of the ilioinguinal nerve emerges through the superficial inguinal ring pierces the external spermatic fascia and descends to supply the skin of the external genitalia and the upper part of the medial side of the thigh. The lateral cutaneous nerves are two in number and are derived from the lower two intercostal nerves, T10, T11. Each nerve pierces the external intercostal muscle and divides into a large anterior branch and a smaller posterior branch, both O1 which emerge between the lower digitations of the external oblique muscle and supply the skin of the side of the abdomen. The larger anterior branches also supply the external oblique muscle. The lateral cutaneous branches of the subcostal and iliohippogastric, T12, L1, nerves descend over the iliac crest and supply the skin of the anterosuperior part of the gluteal region. Cutaneous arteries 
1. The anterior cutaneous arteries are branches of the superior and inferior epigastric arteries, and accompany the anterior cutaneous nerves. 2. The lateral cutaneous arteries are branches of the lower intercostal arteries, and accompany the lateral cutaneous nerves. 3. The superficial inguinal arteries arise from the femoral artery and supply the skin of the lower part of the abdomen. The superficial epigastric artery runs upwards and medially and supplies the skin up to the umbilicus. The superficial external pudendal artery runs medially, to supply the skin of the external genitalia and the adjoining part of the lower abdominal wall. The superficial circumflex iliac artery runs laterally just below the inguinal ligament and along the iliac crest to supply the skin of the abdomen and thigh. Veins The veins accompany the arteries. The superficial inguinal veins drain into the great saphenous vein. Superior vena cava blockage backflow in descending order brachiocephalic subclavian vein axillary vein lateral thoracic vein thoracoepigastric vein superficial epigastric vein great saphenous vein femoral vein inferior vena cava heart, fig 16.5 c. Inferior vena cava blockage backflow in common iliac external iliac femoral great saphena superficial epigastric vein thoracoepigastric vein lateral thoracic vein axillary vein subclavian vein brachiocephalic vein superior vena cava heart. When the portal vein, or the superior vena cava, or the inferior vena cava is obstructed, the superficial abdominal veins are dilated and provide a collateral circulation. The dilated veins that radiate from the umbilicus are given the name caput medusae. They are seen typically in portal obstruction in which blood flow is upwards above the umbilicus, and downwards below the umbilicus. In venocable obstructions, the thoracoepigastric veins open up, connecting the superficial epigastric vein, ending in great saphenous vein, with lateral thoracic vein ending in axillary vein. In superior vena cable obstruction, the blood in the thoracoepigastric vein descend down inwards superficial lymphatics. Lymphatics also pay due respect to the watershed line. Above the level of the umbilicus the lymphatics run upwards to into the axillary lymph nodes. Below the level of the umbilicus they run downwards to drain. Muscles of the anterolateral abdominal wall. The anterolateral abdominal wall is made up of muscles. On either side of the midline, there are four large muscles. These are the external oblique, the internal oblique, the transversus abdominis, and rectus abdominis. Point two small muscles, the cremaster and the pyramid alis, are also present. The external oblique, the e internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis are large flat muscles placed in the anterolateral part of the abdominal wall. Each of them ends in an extensive aponeurosis that reaches the midline. Here the aponeuroses of the right and left sides decussate to form a, a median band called the linea alba. The rectus abdominis runs vertically on either side of the linea alba. It is enclosed in a sheath formed by the aponeuroses of the flat muscles named above. The various muscles are considered one by one below. The actions of these muscles are described later. Dissection Identify the origin of the external oblique from the lower eight ribs, and its interdigitations with serratus anterior in the upper part and with latissimus dorsi in the lower part of its origin. Separate one six digitations from the ribs. Cut vertically, through the muscle to the iliac crest posterior to the sixth digitation. Separate the external oblique from the iliac crest in front of this. Try to avoid injury to the lateral cutaneous branches of the subcostal and iliohippogastric nerves which pierce it close to the iliac crest. Reflect the upper part of the external oblique forwards and expose the deeper internal oblique and its aponeurosis to the line of its fusion with the aponeurosis of the external oblique anterior to rectus abdominis. Just lateral to this line of fusion divide the external oblique aponeurosis vertically till the pubic symphysis. Turn the muscle and aponeurosis inferiorly. This exposes the inferior part of the internal oblique and the lowest portion of aponeurosis of external oblique, i.e. the inguinal ligament. Identify the deep fibers of the inguinal ligament passing posteriorly to the pectin pubis. This is the lacunar ligament or pectineal part of the inguinal ligament. External oblique muscle. Origin. The muscle arises by eight fleshy slips from the outer surfaces middle of the shaft of the lower eight ribs. The fibers run downwards, forwards, and medially. Insertion 
one most of the fibers of the muscle end in a broad aponeurosis through which they are inserted from above downwards into the xiphoid process, linea alba, pubic symphysis, pubic crest, and the pectineal line of the pubis. Two the lower fibers of the muscle are inserted directly into the anterior two-thirds of the outer lip of the iliac crest. Nerve supply. Lower six thoracic nerves. Other points of interest. The upper four slips of origin of the muscle interdigitate with those of the serratus anterior, and the lower four slips with those of the latissimus dorsi one. The junction of the muscle fibers with the aponeurosis lies, a medial to a vertical line drawn from the ninth costal cartilage in the upper part. B below a line joining the anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. Above the ninth costal cartilage the line curves upwards and medially. 2. Between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle the aponeurosis has a free inferior border that is folded on itself to form the requiem, Latin groin, ligament. The ligament is described in detail later. 3. Between the linea semilunaris and the linea alba, the aponeurosis helps to form the anterior wall of rectus sheath. 4. Just above the pubic crest the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle presents a triangular aperture called the superficial inguinal ring. 5. 5. The muscles has free posterior and upper borders internal oblique muscle origin. The muscles arise from, a. The lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament. b. The anterior two-thirds of the intermediate area of the iliac crest, and the thoracolumar fascia. From this origin the fibers run upwards, forwards, and medially crossing the fibers of the external oblique muscle at right angles. Insertion 1. The uppermost fibers are inserted directly into the lower three or four ribs and their cartilages. 2. The greater part of the muscle ends in an aponeurosis through which it is inserted into the 7th, 8th, and 9th costal cartilages, the xiphoid process, linea alba, pubic crest, and the pectineal line of the pubis. It does not extend beyond the costal margin. Nerve supply. Lower six thoracic nerves and the first lumbar nerve. Other points of interest. 1. The junction of the muscle fibers with the aponeurosis is roughly at the lateral border of the rectus abdominis. 2. The aponeurosis takes part in the formation of rectus sheath as follows. Up to the lateral margin of rectus abdominis, the aponeurosis has only one layer. Thereafter, the arrangement of aponeurosis differs in its upper and lower parts. A below a level midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis, lower one-fourth of the wall, the aponeurosis remains a single layer. It passes in front of rectus abdominis to reach linea alba. It, thus, takes part in forming the anterior wall of rectus sheath. B above this level, i.e. upper three-fourth of the wall, the aponeurosis splits into an anterior lamina that passes medially in front of the rectus abdominis, and a posterior lamina that lies behind the rectus. The posterior lamina ends below, at the level midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis, in a free curved margin called the arcuate line or linea semicircularis, border of Douglas. The line is concave downwards. 3. The CONJ ointment tendon is formed partly by this muscle. 4. The cremosphere muscle is formed by fibers of this muscle, and is described later. Transversus abdominis muscles. Dissection. Lift the internal oblique and cut carefully through its attachments to the inguinal ligament, iliac crest, and costal margin. Carefully preserve the nerves of the anterior abdominal wall which lie between internal oblique and transversus abdominis. Cut vertically through the internal oblique from the 12th costal canalage to the iliac crest and reflect the muscle forwards from the transversus and the nerves. Features Origin The muscle has a fleshy origin from, the lateral one-third of the inguinal ligament the anterior two-thirds of the inner lip of the iliac crest. The thoracolumbar fascia The inner surfaces of the lower six costal cartilage the fibers are directed horizontally forwards. Insertion, the fibers end in a broad aponeurosis which is inserted into the xiphoid process, the linea alba, the pubic crest, and the pectineal line of the pubis. The lowest fibers of the muscle fuse with the lowest fibers of the internal oblique to form the CONJ ointment tendon nerve supply, lower six thoracic nerves, and first lumbar nerve. Other points of interest, 
1. The aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis takes part in forming the rectus sheath as follows. 2. Above the level of the arcuate line, upper 3 fourth, the aponeurosis passes medially behind the rectus abdominis muscle along with the posterior lamina of the internal oblique aponeurosis. 3. The lower edge of this part of the aponeurosis helps to form the arcuate line. In the uppermost part, some fleshy fibers of the transversus abdominis may lie behind the rectus abdominis. Below the level of the arcuate line the aponeurosis passes in front of the rectus abdominis and helps to form the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. 4. The neurovascular plane of the abdominal wall lies between the internal oblique and transversus muscles. This plane is continuous with the neurovascular plane of the thoracic wall. Various nerves and vessels run in this plane. 1. The aponeuroses of three flat muscles seem to end in the fibrous raphe to the linea alba. Each aponeurosis is made up of the two laminae, the superficial and deep laminae. The laminae of the two sides interdigitate in a manner that the superficial lamina of one gets continuous with deep lamina of the opposite side and vice versa. This provides enough strength to the anterior abdominal wall, rectus abdominis muscle, origin, the muscle arise by two tendinous heads as follows, lateral head from the lateral part of the pubic crease, medial head from the anterior pubic ligament. The fibers run vertically upwards insertion. On the front of the wall O1 the thorax, along a horizontal line passing laterally from the xiphoid process, and cutting in that order, the 7th, 6th and 5th costal cartilages. Nerve supply. Lower 6 or 7 thoracic nerves. Other points of interest. 1. The muscle is enclosed in a sheath formed mainly by the aponeuroses of the three flat muscles of the abdominal wall. The sheath is described later. 2. Tendonous intersections, these are three transverse fibrous bands which divide the muscle into smaller parts. 1. Lies opposite the umbilicus, the second opposite the free end of the xiphoid process, and the third in between the two. One or two incomplete intersections may be present below the umbilicus. The intersections are actually zigzag in course, traverse only the anterior half of the muscle, and are adherent to the anterior wall of rectus sheath. Embryologically they may represent the segmental origin of muscle, but functionally they make the muscle more powerful by increasing the number of muscle fibers. Actions of the main muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. Support for abdominal viscera, the abdominal muscles provide a firm but elastic support for the abdominal viscera against gravity. This is chiefly due to the tone of the oblique muscles, especially the internal oblique. Two expulsive acts, the oblique muscles, assisted by the transversus, can compress the abdominal viscera and thus help in all expulsive acts, like micturition, defecation, parturition, vomiting, etc. This is one of the most important actions of the abdominal muscles. Three forced expiratory acts, the external oblique can markedly depress and compress the lower part of the thorax producing forceful expiration, as in coughing, sneezing, blowing, shouting, etc. This is also an important action of the abdominal muscles. Point four movement of the trunk A flexion of the trunk or lumbar spine is brought about mainly by the rectus abdominis. B lateral flexion of the trunk is done by one sided contraction of the oblique muscles. C. Rotation of the trunk is produced by a combined action of the external oblique with the opposite internal oblique. Inguinal ligament, I. The inguinal or pupart's ligament is formed by the lower border of the external oblique aponeurosis which is thickened and folded backwards on itself. It extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle, and lies beneath the fold of the groin. Its lateral half is rounded and oblique. Its medial half is grooved D upwards and is more horizontal. Two attachments A. The fascia lata is attached to the lower border. Traction of this fascia makes the ligament convex downwards. B. The upper surface of the ligament gives origin to the internal oblique from its lateral two-thirds, to the transversus abdominis from its lateral one-third, and to the cremaster muscle from its middle part. Three relations. The upper grooved surface of the medial half of the inguinal ligament forms the floor of the inguinal canal and lodges the spermatic cord or round ligament of the uterus. 4-4 Extensions A. 
the pectineal part of the inguinal ligament or lacunar ligament is triangular. Anteriorly, it is attached to the medial end of the inguinal ligament. Posteriorly, it is attached to the pectin pubis. It is horizontal in position and supports the spermatic cord. The apex is attached to the pubic tubercle. The base is directed laterally. It forms the medial boundary of the femoral ring. It is reinforced by the pectineal fascia and by fibers from the linea alba. The pectineal ligament or ligament of Cooper is an extension from the posterior part of the base of the lacunar ligament. It is attached to the pectin pubis. It may be regarded as a thickening in the upper part of the pectineal fascia. B. The reflected part of the inguinal ligament consists of fibers that pass upwards and medially from the lateral cruise of the superficial inguinal ring. It lies behind the superficial inguinal ring and in front of the CONJ ointment tendon. Its fibers interlace with those of the opposite side at the linea alba. Dissection Identify internal oblique deep to external oblique muscle. Remove the fascia from the surface of the internal oblique and its aponeurosis. Identify the part of the internal oblique which passes around the spermatic cord. This is the cremaster muscle. Trace the fibers of internal oblique into the CONJ ointment tendon. Dissect the triple relation of internal oblique to the inguinal canal. CONJ ointment tendon or FALX inguinalis. The CONJ ointment tendon is formed by fusion of the lowest aponeurotic fibers of the internal oblique and of the transversus muscles, attached to the pubic crest and to the medial part of the pectin pubis. Medially, it is continuous with the anterior wall of the rectus sheath. Laterally, it is usually free. Sometimes it may be continuous with an inconstant ligamentous band, named the interbubiovolar ligament, which connects the lower border of the transversus abdominis to the superior ramus of the pubis. The CONJ ointment tendon strengthens the abdominal wall at the site where it is weakened by the superficial inguinal ring. The cremaster muscle The cremaster muscle consists of muscle fasciculi embedded in the cremasteric fascia. The fasciculi form superficial loops from middle one-third of upper surface of inguinal ligament and deep loops from pubic tubercle, pubic crest, and CONJ ointment tendon. Here some fibers may be continuous with the internal oblique or transversus muscles. The medial ends of the loops are attached to the pubic tubercle, the pubic crest or the CONJ ointment tendon. The muscle is fully developed only in the male. In the female it is represented by a few fibers only. Along with the intervening connective tissue, the muscle loops to form a sac-like cremasteric fascia around the spermatic cord and testis. It lies deep to the external spermatic fascia. Nerve supply. Genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, L1. Action. The cremaster helps to suspend the testis and can elevate it. The muscle also tends to close the superficial inguinal ring when the intraabdominal pressure is raised. Cremasteric reflex. Upon stroking the skin of the upper part of the medial side of the thigh there is reflex contraction of the cremaster muscle, as evidenced by elevation and retraction of the testis. The reflex is more brisk in children. In upper motor neuron lesions above segment L1, the reflex is lost. Clinical anatomy. While examining the abdomen, the knees and hip must be flexed to relax the abdominal muscles. Muscles of anterior abdominal wall contract during the expiatory phase of respiration. Due to lack of exercise, the tone of muscles of the anterior abdominal wall decreases leading to protrusion of the wall. This is called visceroptosis. The anterior abdominal wall is punctured for various procedures, like surgeries of gallbladder, vermiform appendix, etc. Supra-umbilical median incisions through the linea alba have several advantages as being bloodless, safety to muscles and nerves but tend to leave a postoperative weakness through which a ventral hernia may develop. Infra-umbilical median incisions are safer because the close approximation of recti prevents formation of any ventral hernia. Paramedian incisions through the rectus sheath are more sound than median incisions. The rectus muscle is retracted laterally to protect the nerve supplying it from any injury. In these cases, the subsequent risk of weakness and of incisional or ventral hernia are minimal. The nerves of anterior abdominal wall, 
T7TI2 and L1 supply skin, intercostal muscles, and parietal pleura. In addition these supply skin, muscles of the abdominal wall and parietal peritoneum. Tubercular infection of lung and pleura may cause radiating pain in the abdominal wall. Peritonitis causes reflex contraction of the abdominal muscles. During repair of the wounds of anterior abdominal wall, the nerves T7 T12 need to be anesthetized along the costal margin. Iliohippogastric and ilioinguinal nerves are anesthetized by a needle above the anterior superior iliac spine on the spino umbilical line. Pyramidalisal, this is a small triangular muscle. It is rudimentary in human beings. It arises from the anterior surface of the body of the pubis. Its fibers pass upwards and medially to be inserted into the linea alba. The muscle is supplied by the subcostal nerve, T12. It is said to be tensor of the linea alba, but the need for such action is not clear. Deep nerves of the anterior abdominal wall. The anterior abdominal wall is supplied by the lower six thoracic nerves or lower five intercostal and subcostal and by the first lumbar nerve through its iliohippogastric and ilioinguinal branches. These are the nerves which emerge as cutaneous nerves. Their deep course is described briefly with the cutaneous nerves in the beginning of this chapter. Deep arteries of anterior abdominal wall. The anterior abdominal wall is supplied by 1 2 large arteries from above the superior epigastric and musculophrenic 2 2 large arteries from below the inferior epigateric and deep circumflex iliac. Small branches of the intercostal, subcostal, and lumbar arteries, which accompany the corresponding nerves. The superior epigastric artery is one of the two terminal branches of the internal thoracic artery. It begins in the sixth intercostal space, and enters the abdomen by passing behind the seventh costal cartilage between the costal and xiphoid origins of the diaphragm. It enters the rectus sheath and runs vertically downwards, supplies the rectus muscle, and ends by anastomosing with the inferior epigastric artery. In addition to muscular and cutaneous branches, it gives a hepatic branch which runs in the falciform ligament, and an anastomotic branch, at the level of the xiphoid process, which anastomoses with the artery of the opposite side. The musculophrenic artery is the other terminal branch of the internal thoracic artery. It runs downwards and laterally behind the seventh costal cartilage, and enters the abdomen by piercing the diaphragm between the seventh and eighth cartilages. It continues downwards and laterally along the deep surface of the diaphragm as far as the tenth intercostal space. It gives branches to the diaphragm, the anterior abdominal wall and the seventh, eighth, and ninth intercostal spaces as the anterior intercostal arteries. The inferior epigastric artery arises from the external iliac artery near its lower end just above the inguinal ligament. It runs upwards and medially in the extraperitoneal connective tissue, passes just medial to the deep inguinal ring, pierces the fascia transversalis at the lateral border of the rectus abdominis and enters the rectus sheath by passing in front of the arcuate line. Within the sheath it supplies the rectus muscle and ends by anastomosing with the superior epigastric artery. It gives off the following branches. A. A cremasteric branch to the spermatic cord, in males, or the artery of the round ligament in females. B. A pubic branch which anastomoses with the pubic branch of the obturator artery. C. Muscular branches to the rectus abdominis. D. Cutonous branches to the overlying skin. The pubic branch may replace the obturator artery, and is then known as the abnormal obturator artery. The deep circumflex iliac artery is the other branch of the external iliac artery, given off from its lateral side opposite the origin of the inferior epigastric artery. It runs laterally and upwards behind the inguinal ligament, pierces the fascia transversalis, and continues along the iliac crest, up to its middle where it pierces the transversus abdominis to enter the interval between the transversus and the internal oblique muscles. At the anterior superior iliac spine it anastomoses with the superior gluteal, the lateral circumflex femoral and superficial circumflex iliac arteries. Just behind the anterior superior iliac spine it gives off an ascending branch which runs upwards in the neurovascular plane. Rectus sheath dissection. Identify the rectus abdominis muscle. 
at the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis, the aponeurosis of the internal oblique splits to pass partly posterior and partly anterior to the rectus abdominis, the anterior layer fusing with the aponeurosis of external oblique and the posterior layer with that of the transversus abdominis. This is how most of the rectus sheath is formed. Identify the arcuate line midway between umbilicus and pubic symphysis. Define the origins of the transversus and follow its aponeurosis to fuse with that of the internal oblique, posterior to the rectus abdominis above the arcuate line and anteriorly to the unsplit aponeurosis of internal oblique below the line. See that aponeurosis of all three muscles pass anterior to rectus abdominis below the arcuate line. Open the rectus sheath by a vertical incision along the middle of the muscle. Reflect the anterior layer of the sheath sideways, cutting its attachments to the tendinous intersections in the anterior part of the rectus muscle, Fig 16.15. Lift the rectus muscle and identify the 711 intercostal and subcostal nerves entering the sheath through its posterior lamina, piercing the muscle and leaving through its anterior wall. Divide the rectus abdominis transversely at its middle. Identify its attachments and expose the posterior wall of the rectus sheath by reflecting its parts superiorly and inferiorly. Identify and trace the superior and inferior epigastric arteries. Define the arcuate line on the posterior wall of the rectus sheath. Rectus sheath. Definition. This is an aponeurotic sheath covering the rectus abdominis. It has two walls, anterior and posterior. Features. Anterior wall, 1 it is complete covering the muscle from end to end. 2 it s composition is variable as described below. It is firmly adherent to the tendinous intersections of the rectus muscle. Posterior wall. It is incomplete, being deficient above the costal margin and below the arcuate line. Point 1 it s composition is variable as described below. It is free from the rectus muscle. Medial whale. Fusion of all the aponeuroses in the midline. It is called as linea alba. Lateral wall. It is called linea semilunaris, it extends from tip of ninth costal cartilage to pubic tubercle. Formation. Details about the formation of the walls are as follows. Above the costal margin. Anterior wall, external oblique aponeurosis. Posterior wall, it is deficient. The rectus muscle rests directly on the 5th, 6th, and 7th costal cartilages. Between the costal margin and the arcuate line anterior wall, external oblique aponeurosis and anterior lamina of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique. Posterior wall, posterior lamina of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and aponeurosis of the transversus muscle. Midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis, the posterior wall of the rectus sheath ends in the arcuate line semicircularis or old of Douglas. The line is concave downwards. Below the arcuate line. Anterior null, aponeuroses of all the three flat muscles of the abdomen. The aponeuroses of the transversus and the internal oblique are fused, but the external oblique aponeurosis remains separate. Posterior wall, it is deficient. The rectus muscle rests on the fascia transversalis. Contents Muscles 1. The rectus abdominis is the chief and largest content. 2. The pimrited clea lies in front of the lower part of the rectus abdominis. Arteries 1. The superior epigastric artery enters the sheath by passing between the costal and xiphoid origins of the diaphragm. It crosses the upper border of the transversus abdominis behind the seventh costal cartilage. It supplies the rectus abdominis muscle and anastomosis with the inferior epigastric artery. 2. The inferior epigastric artery enters the sheath by passing in front of the arcuate line. Veins. 1. The superior epigastric vena comitans accompany its artery and join the vena comitans of internal thoracic vein. 2. The inferior epigastric vena comitans accompany it s artery and go in the external iliac vein. 0. Nerves. These are the terminal parts of the lower 6 thoracic nerves, including the lower 5 intercostal serves and the subcostal nerves. Functions. 1. It checks bowing of rectus muscle during its contrition and thus increases the efficiency of the muscle. 
2. It maintains the strength of the anterior abdominal wall. New concept of rectus sheath. Rectus sheath is formed by decussating fibers from three abdominal muscles of each side. Each forms a bilaminar aponeurosis at their medial borders. Fibers from all three anterior leaves run obliquely upwards, while the posterior fibers run obliquely downwards at right angles to anterior leaves. Anterior sheath of rectus. Both leaves of external oblique aponeurosis and anterior leaf of internal oblique aponeurosis. Posterior sheath. Posterior leaf of aponeurosis of internal oblique and both leaves of aponeurosis of transversus abdominis. Fibers of each layer decussate to the opposite side of the sheath. Fibers also decussate between anterior and posterior sheaths. The three lateral abdominal muscles may be said to be degastric with a central tendon in the form of linea alba. Linea alba is a tendinous raphe between xiphoid process above to symphysis pubis and pubic crest below. Above the umbilicus the linea alba is broader. Superficial fibers of linea alba are attached to symphysis pubis, while deep fibers are attached behind rectus abdominis to posterior surface of pubic crest. The fascia transversalis. Definition. The inner surface of the abdominal muscles is lined by fascia which is separated from peritoneum by extraperitoneal connective tissue. That part of the fascia which lines the inner surface of the transversus abdominis muscle is called the fascia transversalis. Extenral, anteriorly, it is adherent to the linea alba above the umbilicus. Posteriorly, it merges with the anterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia and is continuous with the renal fascia, fig 16.24b. Superiorly, it is continuous with the diaphragmatic fascia. Inferiorly, it is attached to the inner lip of the iliac crest and to the lateral half of the inguinal ligament. At both these places it is continuous with the fascia iliaca. Medially it is attached to the pubic tubercle, the pubic crest and the pectineal line. Part of it is prolonged into the thigh as the anterior wall of the femoral sheath. Opening of deep inguinal ring. About 1.2 cm above the midinguinal point there is an oval opening in the fascia transversalis. This opening is the deep inguinal ring, fig 16.25. The ring lies immediately lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. It transmits the spermatic cord in males, and the round ligament of the uterus in females. Prolongations 1. A tubular prolongation of the fascia transversalis surrounds the spermatic cord forming the internal spermatic fascia. 2. Over the femoral vessels, the fascia transversalis is prolonged into the thigh as the anterior femoral sheath. Relation to vessels and nerves the main arteries of the abdominal wall and pelvis lie inside the fascia transversalis, while the main nerves are outside. That is why the femoral vessels are inside the femoral sheath, while the femoral nerve is outside the sheath. Dissection Identify again the superficial inguinal ring above the pubic tubercle. It lies in the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle and provides the external spermatic fascia to the spermatic cord slash round ligament of uterus. Identify internal oblique muscle deep to external oblique. Note that its fibers lie anterior to deep inguinal ring, then arch over the inguinal canal and finally fuse with the fibers of transversus abdominis to form the CONJ ointment tendon attached to pubic crest and pectin pubis. Lastly identify the deep inguinal ring in the fascia transversalis situated 1.2 cm above the midinguinal point. This fascia provides the internal spermatic fascia to the spermatic cord slash round ligament of uterus definition. This is an oblique intermuscular passage in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall, situated just above the medial half of the inguinal ligament length and direction, it is about 4 cm, 1.5 inches, long, and is directed downwards, forwards, and medially the inguinal canal extends from the deep inguinal ring to the superficial inguinal ring. The deep inguinal ring is an oval opening in the fascia transversalis, situated 1.2 cm above the midinguinal point, and immediately lateral to the stem of the inferior epigastric artery. The superficial inguinal ring, is a triangular gap in the external oblique aponeurosis. It is shaped like an obtuse angled triangle. The base of the triangle is formed by the pubic crest. 
the two sides of the triangle form the lateral or lower and the medial or upper margins of the opening. It is 2.5 cm long and 1.2 cm broad at the base. These margins are referred to as cram. At and beyond the apex of the triangle, the two crura are united by intercrural fibers. Boundaries The anterior wall The whole extent, a skin B. Superfacial fascia The posterior wall, a fascia transversalis B. The extirporate pineal tissues The medial wall, a conjoint tendon B. Reflected part of inguinal ligament Roof it is formed by the arched fibers of the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles. Fiori. It is formed by the grooved upper surface of the inguinal ligament, and at the medial end by the lacunar ligament, Fig 16.26b. Sex difference. The inguinal canal is larger in males than in females. Structures passing through the canal. L. The spermatic cord IRT males, or the round ligament of the uterus in females, enters the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring and passes out through the superficial inguinal ring. The ilioinguinal nerve enters the canal through the interval between the external and internal oblique muscles and passes out through the superficial inguinal ring. Constituents of the spermatic cord, these are as follow, 1 the ductus deferens, 2 the testicular and cremastric arteries and veins, 1 in its lateral one third, the fleshy fibers of the internal oblique muscle. 2. The pampiniform plexus of veins. 3. Lymph vessels form the testes. 4. The ilioinguinal nerve, genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, and the plexus of sympathetic nerves around the artery to the ductus deferens and visceral afferent nerve fibers. 5. Remains of the processus vaginalis. Coverings of spermatic cord from within outwards, these are as follows. The internal spermatic fascia, derived from the fascia transversalis, it covers the cord in its whole extent. The cremasteric fascia is made up of the muscle loops constituting the cremaster muscle, and the intervening areolar tissue. It is derived from the internal oblique and transversus abdominis muscles, and therefore covers the cord below the level of these muscles. 3. The external spermatic fascia is derived from the external oblique aponeurosis. It covers the cord below the superficial inguinal ring. Mechanism of inguinal canal The presence of the inguinal canal is a cause of weakness in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall. This weakness is compensated by the following factors. Oligoity of the inguinal canal, the two inguinal rings do not lie opposite each other. Therefore, when the intraabdominal pressure rises the anterior and posterior walls of the canal are approximated, thus obliterating the passage. This is known as the flap valve mechanism. 1. The superficial inguinal ring is guarded from behind by the CONJ ointment tendon and by the reflected part of the inguinal ligament. 2. The deep inguinal ring is guarded from the front by the fleshy fibers of the internal oblique. Dot shutter mechanism of the internal oblique This muscle has a triple relation to the inguinal canal. It forms the canal. When it contracts the roof is approximated to the floor, like a shutter. The arching fibers of the transversus also take part in the shutter mechanism. 2. Contraction of the cremaster helps the spermatic cord to plug the superficial inguinal ring, half valve 3. Contraction of the external oblique results in approximation of the two crura of the superficial inguinal ring, slit valve mechanism. The integrity of the superficial inguinal ring is greatly increased by the intercrural fibers. Hormones may play a role in maintaining the tone of the inguinal musculature. Whenever, there is a rise in intraabdominal pressure as in coughing, sneezing, lifting heavy weights all these mechanisms come into play, so that the inguinal canal is obliterated, its openings are closed, and herniation of abdominal viscera is prevented. Development of inguinal canal Inguinal canal represents the passage of gubernaculum through the abdominal wall. It extends from the caudal end of the developing gonad, in lumbar region, to the labiascrotal swelling. In early life, the canal is very short. As the pelvis increases in width, the deep inguinal ring is shifted laterally and the adult dimensions of the canal are attained. Hernia is a protrusion of any of the abdominal contents through any of its walls. 
This is called external hernia. At times the intestine or omentum protrudes into the no entry zone within the abdominal cavity itself. The condition is called as internal hernia. Hernia consists of a sac, contents, and coverings. Sac is the protrusion of the peritoneum. It comprises a neck, the narrowed part, and a body, the bigger part. Contents are mostly the long mobile, keen to move out, coils of small intestine or omentum or any other viscera. Coverings are the layers of abdominal wall which are covering the hernial SAE. Complications Irreducibility In the beginning, the loop of intestine herniates out but comes back to the abdomen. At times, the loop goes out but does not return, leading to irreducible hernia. Obstruction The loop may get narrowed in part, so that contents or the loop cannot move forwards, leading to obstruction. Strangulation when the arterial supply is blocked, the loop gets necrosed. Types of abdominal hernia INT eternal hernia Protrusion of loop of intestine within a no-entry zone of peritoneum. Internal hernia mostly occurs in epiploic foramen or opening into the lesser sac or foramen of Winslow. The loop mostly gets strangulated. It may also occur in the paraduodenal fossae. These are discussed in Chapter 18. External hernia Umbilical Paraumbilical Femoral Inguinal Epigastric Divarication of recti Incisional Lumbar Umbilical hernia, congenital umbilical hernia, one to non-return of midgut loop back to the abdominal cavity Acquired infantile umbilical hernia Due to weakness of umbilical scar a part of the gut may be seen protruding out. It disappears as the infant grows, Fig 16.30. Paraumbilical hernia, loop of intestine protrude through the linea alba around the region of umbilicus. Femoral hernia, occurs more in females, due to larger pelvis, smaller blood vessels and larger femoral canal. Its neck lies below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. Surgery is essential for its treatment. Inguinal hernia, protrusion of the loop of intestine through the inguinal wall or inguinal canal is called inguinal hernia. When the protrusion occurs through the deep inguinal ring, inguinal canal, superficial inguinal ring into the scrotum, it is called indirect or oblique inguinal hernia. It occurs in male infants, children, and has a narrow neck of the hernial sac. When the protrusion occurs through the weak posterior wall of the inguinal canal or triangle of Hesselbach the hernia is a direct inguinal hernia. It occurs in much older men and has a wider neck of hernial sac. Differences between indirect and direct hernia are given in Table 16.1. A indirect or oblique hernia, occurs due to partial or complete patency of the processus vaginalis, an invagination of the peritoneum. It may descend into the scrotum. The coverings are, I extraperitoneal tissue, 2 internal spermatic fascia, 3 cremasteric fascia, 4 external spermatic fascia. Skin B direct inguinal hernia occurs through the posterior wall of the inguinal canal. It occurs through a selbicus triangle, bounded by interior epigastric artery, lateral border of rectus abdernines, and inguinal ligament. This area is divided into a medial and lateral parts by the passage of obliterated umbilical artery. Coverings of the lateral direct inguinal hernia, I extraperitoneal tissue. 2 fascia transversalis. 3 cremasteric fascia. 4 external spermatic fascia. Skin. Coverings of medial direct inguinal hernia, 1 extraperitoneal tissue. 2 fascia transversalis. 3 CONJ ointment tendon. 4 external spermatic fascia 5 skin epigastric hernia it occurs through the upper part of wide linea alba divarication of recti occurs in multiparous female with weak anterolateral abdominal muscles loop of intestine protrude during coughing but returns back incisional hernia occurs through the anterolateral abdominal wall when some incisions were made for the surgery involving cutting o1 the spinal nerves Lumbar hernia occurs through the lumbar triangle in the posterior part of the abdominal wall. It is bounded by the iliac crest, 
anterior border of latissimus dorsi and posterior border of external oblique muscle. Morphology The inguinal hernia peculiarly occurs only in man and not in any other mammal. This predisposition of man to hernia is due to the evolutionary changes that have taken place in the inguinal region as a result of his upright posture. He has to pay a heavy price for being upright. The important changes are as follows. 1. The iliac crest has grown forwards into the lower digitations of external oblique muscle, so that the inguinal ligament can no more be operated by fleshy fibers of muscle which now helps in balancing the body. In all other mammals, external oblique has no attachment to the iliac crest. The internal oblique and transversus initially originated from the anterior border of ilium and the sheath of iliopsoas, and acted as a powerful sphincter of the inguinal canal. The shift of their origin to the inguinal ligament and iliac crest has minimized their role. Due to peculiar growth of hip bones and pelvis, the crural passage, between hip bone and inguinal ligament, in man has become much wider than any other mammal. This predisposes to femoral hernia. Mnemonic spermatic cord contents 3-3-3-3 arteries, testicular artery, artery to ductus deferens, cremasteric artery 3 nerves, genital branch of the genitofemoral, ilioinguinal, autonomic nerves other things, ductus deferens, pampiniform plexus, remains of processus vaginalis transpyloric plane is an important landmark in the abdominal cavity. Umbilicus is normally a region of watershed for the lymphatic and venous drainage. It is an important landmark. At umbilicus three systems meet. These are digestive, vitellointestinal duct, the excretory, uricus, and vascular, umbilical vessels. Thoracic tense spinal nerve supplies the region of umbilicus. External oblique is the largest and most superficial muscle of anterior abdominal wall. Internal oblique forms anterior wall, roof, and posterior wall of the inguinal canal. It forms rectus sheath differently in upper and lower parts of abdominal wall. It also forms the cremaster muscle and CONJ ointment tendon. Rectus abdominis is the largest content of rectus sheath. Transversus abdominis interdigitates with the fibers of thoracoabdominal diaphragm. Inguinal ligament forms the boundary between abdomen and lower limb. Cremasteric reflex indicates that L1 segment of spinal cord is intact inguinal hernia lies above and medial to pubic tubercle. Femoral hernia lies below and lateral to pubic tubercle. Femoral hernia is never congenital. Femoral hernia is common in females because of the larger pelvis, bigger femoral canal and smaller femoral artery. Indirect inguinal hernia is more liable to obstruction as the neck of such a hernia is narrow. Paramedian incision in the anterior abdominal wall is mostly preferred.